Today, I ask Paula Fredrickson, how much did Hellenism impact the Greco-Roman world to a point where those who lived within the Greco-Roman world, Jews and Christians, how much were they impacted by the thoughts of the pagans around them? We have this idea of categories that we've created to try and understand Jewish thinking, Christian thinking, and other thinking. How erroneous are those categories when we're trying to imagine what a Jew, what a Christian, what a pagan would have believed or thought or even practiced in the first century? Thank you to everybody who's helped us here on making this trip possible. And thank you for joining the Patreon. You're gaining access to this before everyone else, but also you're keeping Myth Vision alive. Paula, thank you again. I can't tell you how much I am honored to interview you today. Um, your work, you've approached your understanding of various forms of Judaism and emerging Christianity in their broader context of ancient Mediterranean culture and ethno-religious history. To what degree does this broader Hellenized world contrast with more traditional and insulated world of Jews or Christians? Traditional scholarship used to look to rabbinic Judaism as a baseline for what all Jews did all the time and imagined that Jews were in some kind of bell jar, even if they were in the diaspora, or if they were in the diaspora and not in a bell jar, they were naughty Jews. But um, in fact, it's uh, Jewish, the whole neighborhood got Hellenized after Alexander the Great, right, in minus 333. So it's Greek has become the English of antiquity. Um, Greek gods are everywhere. Um, Jews are mo ancient monotheists in the way that they think their God is the highest God, but that still leaves plenty of room for other gods. Um, Philo of Alexandria, who is an observant Jew in his fashion, um, writes a commentary on Genesis and talks about um, God creating the gods which he associates with the stars and planets. And he calls, he calls stars and planets gods, which just makes good Mediterranean sense. We still call them Jupiter and Saturn and Venus and Mercury, right? Right. So uh, that comes from somewhere. Um, so Jews were actually very much at home in Greco-Roman antiquity. And you have synagogue inscriptions that manumit slaves that begin, we can't tell if it's a, a pagan god fearer or just a regular Jewish member of the community who's manumitting a slave in the synagogue, which is where you, you do this sort of thing, calling on the God of Israel, you know, the highest and most blessed God, giving the name of the slave, putting her under the supervision of the synagogue, and calling as witness Zeus, Gaia, and Helios, the, the sky, the earth, and the sun. Those are gods. Big we, deal. We have, we have zodiac, mosaic zodiacs on synagogue floors. They're, that's the wheel of heaven. Those are, those are divinities. The word God itself is stretchable, right? Moses is called God uh, in Exodus. We have Origen in his commentary on Romans says that um, David and Paul were not men but gods. He calls them gods. And of course, the Roman emperor is a god. So god is something, is one of these stretchable, stretchable terms uh, that is not, we think of god as in a completely different category from, from humans, but in fact, it's more like on a gradient. And um, so divinity is something that, the multiplicity of divinity is something that ancient Jews, and Paul in particular, are perfectly aware of. Paul wouldn't be talking about the god of this world, or he wouldn't be talking about heavenly knees and earthly knees and subterranean knees in Philippians 2, if he weren't also accommodating this idea of multiple divinities as, as part of the world. Mm. Uh, reminds me when Jesus says, it is written, ye are gods, you know. Um, now, whether he actually said this or not, it's a big question. But well, he didn't say it in Greek, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is implied here? Do you think this plays into that idea when he says, uh, I... It is written, you are gods. I mean, well, I know judges is what people have tried to say it means. I don't, I don't know what that, what that would mean in that phrase, but it's, it certainly means that you're elevated and beyond the normal scope of the human. 
And if you become, again, as Paul says, if you get a star body, a, a pneumatic body when Christ comes back, um, stars are gods. Hmm. Uh, I love this. As I read Yesus Deus by M. David Litwa. Yes. Good Fabulous book. book. Wonderful book. Yeah, I mean, he he kind of specifies this issue where we want um, we want everything to be from Mother Judaism, uh, but at the same time, as if Mother Judaism wasn't dating a lot of other pagan guys, right? Right, <laughs> and that's an interesting thing. So it's not like you know Judaism or that's anachronistic to even use the term, but Jewish religion and, and the culture, the cultural traditions that go back to what we call Jews, um, there seems to have already been blends. In fact, I was wondering about the assumption of Moses and Josephus. And I was like, when I read my Bible, like I always read this and was like, all right, he died. And then like God just made sure he was buried. And it was like, mm -hmm. like this is buried what the Bible. Buried himself, right. Right, like Jim Moses is dead. Like I'm a Christian reading my Bible. I was in high school. I remember it's like Moses died. Then I heard someone went, you yeah, Moses never died. In fact, that's why he shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Enoch or uh, with Elijah and Jesus. Right. And I was like, what are you talking about? The Bible says he died. And like, no, Josephus says he was taken. And I'm like, Okay, what's going on? Lots of people. I mean, look at Enoch, right? Um, right. He, lots of people get taken, and lots of people end up in heaven, which makes them a very good source for revelations, which is why their names show up on these on these uh, on these documents. But there is no essence of any of these religions. There is no essence of Judaism, which then somehow forms a hybrid with something else. People live in the cultures they live in, and it's just as you were saying, it's just part of what's in the atmosphere. And a Jew in Rome probably does something different from a Jew in Corinth who does something different from a Jew in Persia, right? I mean, but they're dealing with, Jewishness is a kind of high-tech religion in antiquity because it has a book. Mm. And the book is, is either available in Semitic languages or in Greek. But that makes ideas of Jewishness transportable. But they are interpreted only in a local context. So there, there is no essence of Judaism, just like there is no essence of paganism, just like there is no essence of Christianity. There are all sorts of different Christi Christiannesses as well. <laughs> I love the way you put that. Because it made me think, like, we want to draw these fine lines between, oh, here are the Jews. Now, don't get me wrong. You could, you could recognize certain groups, social groups. But when you look at Joe Pagan, who comes in and he goes to Zeus on, on you know, whatever day of the week, he decides to go pay homage to Zeus and Athena or whoever might be, and mm -hmm. then goes over to the synagogue. And it's like... Well. Oh, the God of Israel. Uh, Origen has a line in the Contra Calcium that... Um, um, the God of the Hebrews is invoked um, not only by Jews, but by almost anybody who deals in magic. Just normal. We have magical recipes in papyri where so many different gods are summoned, including Yao, um, that you can't tell if it's a Jewish, a pagan, or a Christian um, document, which says to me that it's our analytical categories mm -hmm. that are being imported because we're trying to make an identification. But in terms of the experience of the not only the client who's going to the magician, but to the magician adept who's trying to get these gods to cooperate so he can get done what he needs to get done. Did he think of himself as a Jew or a Christian or a pagan? Why can't the answer just be yes? I love that answer, by the way. It, it leads into something else that isn't quite into, you, it overlaps with what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Daniel McClellan, who's actually a PhD, who wrote a book called Yahweh's Divine Images. And he goes back and showing, using a lot of science, uh, going and explaining like some of the science of why people leave and all that, that, building up to his point. But in it, he points out how a lot of scholars are pointing out the categories we call religion are just not good. They, they don't fit. They don't fit. And, and just like you're describing like the social aspect, even when you go into the religious practices, we call them religious practices, but the practices of them. Um, he compared in this interview the tombs and tombstones of, of loved ones to temples that are actual temples. And... Um, we rabbit trailed this really interesting episode together. And at the end, I said, I don't know why I'm thinking this. I'm just, it's heresy for me to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. What if Yahweh was an ancient 
warrior or king of some tribe somewhere. He is. A, the Lord is a man of war. I mean, he is a warrior. I'm just thinking in terms of like, you know, what if this, because a lot of men have been deified, right? Kind of like pharaohs were the, gods. That's actually an ancient theory of religion. Varro, who's a, who's a Roman antiquarian, says that a lot of the lower gods are deified heroes. And he laments that um, his culture ended up making images of the, of the gods because he thinks that's at a lower intellectual level than just using this, which is a good philosophical idea. Wow. So people have thought that thought. I don't know why I rabbit trailed to that. It just made sense of the categories we've created. And we, and we hurt ourselves before we even step into the arena to understand because we already have a category we've created. Well, by using Jew, Christian, and pagan, which I do routinely so I'm able to say what I want to say, um, I'm already distorting the historical material because what I'm doing is privileging religious identity as a marker of I, the, the foregrounded marker of identity for Identity seems to be situationally um, activated in antiquity. Um, the Emperor Decius says that every Roman citizen has to uh, do a supplication to the gods for the well-being of the empire in uh, 250. And what happens is that so many Christians do the sacrifice that there's a tremendous problem of disciplining the lapsed after it's over, which means that they weren't looking at pagan sacrifice as something that was out of line. And 250. It's, it's so it's really impressive to learn this. Where do you see, in light of this question, where do you see scholarship heading? Um, do you, we're going to get better at this, I suspect. I don't know, because um, scholarship is like anything else. It's fractured. There are people who belong to this wing of scholarship, and there are people who think they're doing history, and they're really doing theology and historical camouflage. And... Um, then there are people who are um, more at home in uh, pagan, pagan documentation and then fitting uh, Christian or Jewish materials into that. Uh, the study of rabbinics is its own subcontinent. So it's, it's not like if you said scholarship is going, I mean, it's hurting cats. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to those who contributed in the GoFundMe on making this trip possible for these 12 recordings with Paula Fredrickson. I want to give a special shout out to you. Your names are chiseled in history. I also want to thank everybody who has become a patron of MythVision, making stuff like this possible, taking academic work that is hiding behind all of these scholarship, all of these colleges and making it public, public knowledge for everybody to learn.